So um, I think we're going to move on and get started with Don and John. They are doing a tag team talk about improving the odds of success with manure and high priced fertilizer applications. So John is the crop, nutri crop nutrition specialist for Manitoba agriculture and resource development. Previously, John was an extension and field crop researcher with Ontario Ministry of Agriculture and Food. Currently, John is the chair of the Manitoba Soil Fertility Advisory Committee. And John is a certified crop advisor and was recognized by the American Society of Agronomy as the International CCC of the Year in 2014. And Don Clayton is a recently retired from the University of Manitoba, where he was a professor in soil fertility, crop nutrition, and nutrient management. Prior to teaching, and conducting research on a full-time basis in the Department of Soil Science, Don was director of the School of Agriculture at the University of Manitoba, as well as a provincial soil specialist for the Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture and a district agriculturalist for Alberta Agriculture. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to John and Don. Again, just reminding anybody, if they have questions, you can throw them up in the chat as we go along, uh, or you can save them for the end and you can ask them live. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Do you have my screen up there? Yeah, sorry, John. I can see your presentation perfectly. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, thanks very much for that uh, uh, introduction. And I, I think this is great. I love doing these with Dawn. So I'm glad that uh, you allowed us to tag team this. And following on that, uh, Dawn and I are tag teaming. I'm going to cover the fertilizer portion and Dawn's going to deal with uh, the manure portion and maybe uh, complement some of uh, Joanne's uh, observations from her studies. So, uh, so what we're, we're going to focus on, uh, one of the themes we've done in the past is looking at fertilization being risky business. And so uh, we're looking at improving odds of success with manure and high priced fertilizer applications. Uh, again, uh, I'm still gainfully employed, but uh, Don's a pensioner with the University of Manitoba. Uh, and glad to have them out of retirement today. So uh, one of key things that are driving things, why fertilize, farmers wanna be in the fertilization game is that we can see here, crop prices have dr risen dramatically. Uh, I'm gonna try and see if my pointer will let me uh, uh, go here. Uh, and in uh, just the, the, the past year, we've seen, in this case, some very high prices, this uh, graph put together looking at milling wheat, but it doesn't matter the crop, it could be canola, soybeans, corn, they've all seen this uh, large run up in price, meaning that there is for farmers, there's a reward for producing high yields at high price, high value crops. And so there's an opportunity cost should we accidentally under fertilize the crop. So that's why farmers want to ante up and get in the game and take advantage of some of these higher crop values that are out there. Uh, at the same time, we see here simultaneously, uh, here's some data from uh, Alberta Agriculture puts together that allows us to look at fertilizer prices. And close to a mere image, one might say that fertilizer prices have risen dramatically. It increases the cost of fertilization uh, and the risks of over-fertilization in that uh, over-fertilizing now costs you much more money uh, than it would have previously. So we've seen these uh, almost mirror images of run-ups, not just crop demand running up fertilizer prices, but several of these supply chain, uh, tariff, uh, uh, if we go oversee some vindictive measures, but nevertheless, there are world factors driving up the prices of fertilizers. And in Western Canada this summer, we experienced a drought across much of the of the prairies and in fact dry conditions remain and uh, in this environment where we're very dependent on stored soil moisture if we have low reserves the additional risk is that we may not have high yield potential next year although we'd like high yield potential and we'd like to fertilize for it we know that soil reserves are low in areas 
So we're moving to what's called a, a high stakes poker table. It takes more to get in the table with high price fertilizer, but the rewards are potentially high. So to look at the improving odds of success, we're gonna look at nutrient stewardship, the four-hour nutrient stewardship framework. And it's an approach used by industry, government, farmers to achieve responsible nutrient use through the, the four R's, the right source, right rate, right time, and right place. Uh, and I'll focus on the fertilizer management and uh, Don will close with uh, some manure stories. So starting off here, uh, this card game, this is the one I'm holding up my sleeve. The ACE is the soil test, but there are other things, particularly in regards to nitrogen. We look at nitrogen credits, we can look at varying crop needs, crop yield goals. We look at the economics, nitrogen cost and the price. And what we used to call uh, crop husbandry, we now refer to as agronomy. All those are things that are going to uh, be strategic in determining the rate. First is a soil test. And out here in the West, where we freeze tight for the winter, the fall soil test is a very good measure or indication for us of available nitrogen the following year. And we can see that every time we experience a drought, we go back here to some of the, uh, the, the droughts in the late 80s, it leaves us with high levels of residual nitrogen. The only thing that comes close to that is some of the values from this year, where we may traditionally have uh, an average of 20 to 30 pounds residual nitrogen, where uh, in some cases, much more than that this year. That's, this is uh, AgVise Laboratories that functions in the upper uh, Northern Great Plains. Uh, this is their territory. Let's zero in on some Manitoba geography. This is the residual nitrate levels in the two foot sample uh, following wheat. And we can see some areas of Manitoba, not surprisingly where the drought was most severe with some very high median nitrogen levels. Median means half the samples came in above this number, half the samples came in below this number. So we can see some very high levels, particularly in Eastern Manitoba, uh, but again, higher than normal levels in the West. And to zero in a, a little further, looking at how they've displayed a chart, those distribution, of samples with more than 100 pounds per acre nitrate in the top two feet, we could see that in this area, the South Interlake region, almost half of the samples there would have more than that. So there are indeed with soil testing, growers will find some fields that require very little additional nitrogen fertilizer, which in years like this could be great savings. Unfortunately, it comes at a cost it, if you're getting high carryover, it means that last year's crop probably yielded quite low. So the other fertility credits here, I just wanted to, to, to run through them. Uh, Don's going to talk the manure hand. But uh, for forage legumes, we have a, use a book value of a 90 pound nitrogen credit that we start with and then we subtract from that, uh, depending on how thin the legume stand is. And if termination is delayed uh, from midsummer onwards, that credit is reduced. For pulse crops, we offer no credit for soybeans. We continue to do research and show that soybeans are a pig for nitrogen. They take it away, but they don't leave very much. So a zero credit for soybeans. We do see some credit for peas. Traditionally though, we have considered that or tapped into that as the pulse yield bonus. Uh, if you're tight for nitrogen dollars this year, you may decide to capitalize on some of that nitrogen. Historically, we've not done that. Green manure crops are not very common here, but they are used by some uh, organic reduced fertilization growers. And if their thumb rule is uh, for every thousand pounds of dry matter, they may have 15 pounds of nitrogen available for next year's crop. Cover crops, big question mark there. Uh, we know they reduce soil nitrogen in the fall. Uh, they take up nitrogen. They, studies out here and in the upper Midwest just showing that they're not very good at giving it back. And in fact, sometimes we experience yield drag. So 
still question mark on how we're gonna get cover crops to perform. A soil organic matter credit? No, uh, Dawn has done several studies on this and the mineralization uh, uh, from organic matter is of course very dependent on knowledge of in-season moisture. Uh, we don't know what that's necessarily gonna be. And I'll show some examples later. The other thing that, that folks that like to give organic matter credits usually forget to give the immobilization penalty. And in studies here with wheat and things like this, we find that that 30 pound nitrogen credit is easily taken away with the 30 pound immobilization deficit. We, we don't confuse growers talking about these since they're so similar, no credit. Just, just a, a picture here of our 2021 drought. And when we get, did get some rain in late August, we had some tremendous regrowth. Um, and that regrowth tapped into leftover soil nitrate. And for example, this oat field on the left here, uh, there was, uh, I did clippings and in a ton of dry matter, there was 80 pounds of nitrogen. In some of this canola to the uh, right, that was canola that was deemed uh, a, a two to four bushel per acre crop and uh, uh, written off by crop insurance. Later with some rain, Frankenstein came back to life and was produced this biomass with tremendous nitrogen uptake. Big question, we're not gonna get all that nitrogen back in next year's crop. It just does not seem to be re released very much. And so it kind of falls into the cover crop category as a question mark. Uh, looking at how crops differ in their response to uh, um, nitrogen and here, I, I don't know this, I guess I don't gamble enough. The green chips are the most expensive ones and our high nitrogen use crops corn, canola, spring and, and spring wheat and winter cereals. Some of our, our more modest users of nitrogen are oats and flax. Low response, or where we tend not to use much would be soybeans or peas. Dry beans are a question mark. Historically, we've had some pretty aggressive recommendations for nitrogen on dry beans, but we do have some current research revisiting that. Again, although we do get some response to it, it, uh, it is something where people may look at the chance to reduce rates. Uh, just a note about phosphorus and potassium needs. Have to watch that someone's not dealing from the bottom of the deck here. And soybeans tend to be that crop. They do not respond to uh, phosphorus in studies that Don Flayton and students have run in Manitoba, um, numerous phosphorus and potassium studies not responding to fertilizer, they just do an excellent job of uh, robbing from the bank and uh, reducing soil reserves. So we may get away with some lower rates on soybeans this year, as long as we have the discipline to make that up with better priced fertilizer in the future. And then the, 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 the low users, for example, flax, that does not respond a lot to uh, uh, nutrients like phosphorus. Um, and anytime we have to seed crops later in the season into warm soils, our response or benefit to phosphorus is, is reduced. So we know that that, that aspect of uh, a production can affect the, the need. I've, I've put up here just to illustrate some of the, the crops and their response to nitrogen, some, some of our stylized curves uh, that uh, I've drawn from uh, some uh, Manitoba data sets. And uh, looking at the quadratic curve here, it uh, allows us to do some calculation of most economic rates. Although our data does not always fit this curve very well, uh, we're using it in this instance. So with corn, and I should say on the, the uh, up down axis is the yield in bushels per acre. The bottom axis is nitrogen supply. The soil, that two foot soil test, plus the nitrogen fertilizer applied. Uh, so it's, uh, it's including whatever we know as far as an available nitrogen supply. Those crops tend to come in with a, a, a demand need of between 150 to 200 pounds of total supply. Interestingly, with that uh, curve on the corn, if corn was $5, uh, if we went a year ago to what corn prices and fertilizer prices were, it would be up suggesting 190 pounds of nitrogen per acre. 
for every 10 cents per pound, nitrogen goes up, that optimum rate declines about 10 pounds per acre. But if fertilizer price or if crop prices have stayed up, it tends to counterbalance uh, uh, that, that decline. Uh, if you look at the uh, other crops here, we have uh, barley and wheat, and uh, those tend to be uh, responding to things in the order 110 to 120 or 150 pounds of nitrogen. And then a low need crop like oats. And for that, uh, the work done, gosh, a quarter century ago now, uh, uh, the work tend to show that the optimum uh, uh, nitrogen rate was just about 100 pounds of total in supply per acre. So we have some of these uh, 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 response curves that we can use in some decision making. Here we're just looking at which tend to be the heavy feeders. Interestingly, out here on the prairies, we need to acknowledge that, that the nitrogen needs differ based on moisture. Under dry conditions, we have reduced yield potential, but more nitrogen may actually be needed. That's because we have reduced nitrogen efficiency under dry conditions. We've got less mineralization, less mass flow to the roots. And so uh, I'm going to show some response curves here that uh, are, are, are interesting because they're, they're developed under some different moisture regimes. Uh, this one here is uh, our spring wheat response to nitrogen under a moist environment. Uh, so kind of a, a classic yield response curve. And, and that, that one uh, was developed from 18, um, 18 sites in, in, in Manitoba, Saskatchewan area. Oh. If we look at uh, the dry environment, this was some, oh, I'm ahead of myself here. That this was from some uh, 67 sites. We can see that the yield is less because it's drier. But if we're looking at nitrogen efficiency, we see that uh, we achieve 40 pounds, uh, 40 bushels per acre with less than 50 pounds of nitrogen under a moist regime where it takes at least two times that amount of nitrogen under the dry regime to get that type of yield. So in essence, it looks like uh, moisture, in-season moisture or moist conditions uh, 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 are a, a replacement for uh, uh, nitrogen. If we look at a uh, environment, uh, 55 sites actually under arid or droughty conditions, we see that yield is capped at a low level and we just get no longer response to nitrogen. And in fact, in the droughty areas in Manitoba this year, 31 to 33 bushels per acre of wheat was the norm. And so whatever nitrogen had been supplied uh, in excess to that, that's what's been ending up as our nitrate soil reserves. Our corn yield responses show something similar. Uh, both Don and I've had a kick at the can here. Uh, I ran uh, 10 studies in 2016 to 2017. What we're referring to here is some moist years. Not necessarily a lot of in-season rainfall, but one of those years had low rainfall, but full soil reserves. And we could see under the higher yield uh, group that we produced, uh, the axis was 150 bushels per acre with seemingly no nitrogen here. Uh, that's uh, maybe taking into account the large amount of mineralization you might expect. If we go to, then once Don and uh, student Lanny got in the game, they end up some dry year environments. And so to compare their green line to my uh, uh, blue one up there, you can see that the zero nitrogen the check yield is about half that. that mineralization given the year with some good, not excessive, but some good in-season in moisture goes a long way to supplying nitrogen needs of the crop. Their yields were less. Uh, their response to applied nitrogen was actually a bit higher than uh, this somewhat flat curve, but high yielding curve uh, I experienced. So we've, we've harnessed uh, over 10 years ago, fertilizer prices ran up in the 2008 and uh, ourselves, like uh, most US states and others, developed uh, a, a tool for growers to assess what's the economically optimum rate. 
And this is, this is our tool. This is our nitrogen rate calculator. And it uh, will, uh, based on uh, yield data sets we had for spring wheat, barley, and canola, uh, growers have this option where you, we would put in uh, values of estimated crop price, uh, for, for fertilizer price, and uh, the soil test nitrogen. In this case, we're look, looking at a crop of uh, uh, hybrid canola. And in the, within the chart here, the blue cells are the ones where the uh, uh, maximum return is, is achieved. So that would be right up until where $1 of crop is, is returning $1, uh, the same dollar you're spending on nitrogen. I actually like to look at that range. The orange bars on the outside of that are within a $1 per acre of the optimum range. And that actually suggests, you know, you've got about a 40 pound of nitrogen window to hit the very similar economic spot. So as uh, we can see here with this example, as urea price goes up for every 100 pounds uh, uh, per ton at the top there, at the expensive uh, rate, it does ratchet back the applied nitrogen rate. And as nitrogen becomes le less expensive, it increases the rate of nitrogen to, again, squeeze out more bushels. Uh, Don actually worked out some scenarios here about how uh, the, this calculator could be used. Uh, the top example here, uh, and this is looking at 30 pounds residual nitrogen, but if we look at uh, a modest fertilizer cost and a modest crop value, uh, such as perhaps a year ago, we could see that the model would suggest the optimum end rate is 115 pounds of nitrogen and we're achieving uh, near full yields with that yield curve. If we went to a situation looking at high fertilizer and high crop price, well, we're back to almost very similar nitrogen rate, very similar yield being achieved. If for reason we would have high fertilizer price, but modest crop prices, last year's crop prices, what well, does ratchet back somewhat, and we do leave some yield on the table uh, in order to uh, optimize return. If we look at what happens if we uh, fertilize that way and have modest prices, but it is dry again. So yield potential is limited. And there we're looking at only 25 pounds of nitrogen required for optimum. But again, the, the lid on production is set by water and it's about 31 bushels the acre. This is how people can use this type of a tool below is a similar case with canola. I just mentioned that with canola, when canola prices are, are high, it tends to force some very high nitrogen rates in order to squeeze out those last few bushels. So we see that uh, here, uh, our mo model uh, uh, tops out at about 52 bushels the acre. So we fertilize for almost full yield when we're at uh, modest fertilizer uh, and modest crop prices, similar high fertilizer, high crop prices. And we do ratchet back somewhat when high fertilizer prices, modest crop prices, it does reduce the nitrogen rate, but only really tinkers with the crop yield. Next card, the last one I think we're playing here on nitrogen is, is agronomy and nitrogen rates. And we know that it could be impacted based on the rotation that uh, uh, you're following in your fields that can have impact. Um, something else, seeding dates, we get better nitrogen response to early seeded uh, uh, crops. If you're seeding late, you could probably reduce your nitrogen, your yield potential's down, your response to nitrogen's down. For variety selection, I should mention there that um, we've had variety improvement with some, uh, not necessarily a difference in yield response, but uh, yield level. And if we go to those previous wheat yield curves, uh, actually a Amy Maget, our host here, and Don Flayton did work with improved varieties and found not good uh, curvilinear response when we put the data together, but the same relationship as the other one. At optimum yield potential, 
it was taking about 2.3 pounds of nitrogen per bushel uh, in that yield curve. And that's a similar relationship that you found with your much higher yielding varieties. And uh, weed control, uh, especially early weed control is very important for nitrogen efficiency, particularly in corn, some great work out of Wisconsin, spray early and spray often and keep fields weed free and it'll substitute for nitrogen. Um, crops respond to phosphorus, uh, just putting this in here, just a reminder that the phosphorus soil test is very important. We use this uh, classic research from Saskatchewan for many lessons, uh, but the, the case here is to look at that blue line on the bottom is indicative of a, um, a, a low phosphorus soil test. The two green lines above it had received batch applications of phosphorus earlier and built up to a, a somewhat higher level. So we're looking at what's the importance of keeping my fertilizer rates high in a year like this. And we can see that if we're on low testing fields, yes, to get what yield potential is there, I generally need to maintain fertilizer rates uh, 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 according to the soil test recommendations. So close to the max here. Whereas where I have built up soil tests and they are operating in the medium or high range, I may be able to apply quite a bit less than removal amounts, starter rates, and still get good yield levels, uh, knowing full well that I'm exploiting or drawing down soil reserves. And so uh, we expect that uh, many farmers have been asking this, this question. Those that have been undertaking a, a, a program to replenish depleted soil reserves may have this card to play also, that they can back off on their replenished fields but on depleted fields, uh, they'll probably have to keep their rates close to normal levels. The other aspect of the uh, efficiency gain is if we look at the source and where enhanced efficiency fertilizers come in or cost. The other is timing, We're looking at fall, at seeding applications or, or in-crop splits. And the other one is placement or banding. Now, for those of you in the West, you, you've, you know, this was like the, the tablet Moses carried down from the mountains place. We know that the place for nitrogen fertilizer ideally is in the band. And let me run through the reasons. Uh, we eliminate surface runoff. A band application slows, denit slows nitrification, which would slow, uh, reduce leaching and denitrification loss. Uh, it eliminates volatilization if we've replaced it there. It reduces immobilization with straw and it advantages the crop over, over weeds by placing it in a band. So we know historically why banding was a preferred way. Uh, people always ask me, what's changed now that we have these other options, enhanced efficiency fertilizers, etc. Is banding still required or important. So inquiring minds need to know, so I'm gonna show you. Recent studies, um, and these are done at IHARF. Uh, Chris Holzaffel, our good friend over there, has been laboring away, uh, and he has been doing uh, 4R nitrogen management studies the last four or five years, evaluating multiple uh, uh, types of placement, source, and timing. And I encourage you to look at uh, one of his more recent updates here. And uh, in order to put them together in, in a table, I've taken the liberty of indexing to uh, the yields to what uh, he's considered the gold standard or is at seeding side banded urea. And I'll, I'll work through just a couple illustrations here. So uh, this is uh, the two years he did this with canola and looking at, uh, again, the first one is side banded, urea at 100%. I have the sources listed at the bottom, green for urea and agri, white for urea, green for agritain treated urea, uh, blue for super U, uh, uh, yellow for ESN. And in the spring, it included a UAN solution uh, dribbled. So looking at these, if we look at the fall broadcast, 
Um, doesn't matter what type of additives, it's not coming close within uh, uh, to the spring applied sideband. And in fact, the, the spring broadcast uh, uh, nitrogen is really not performing that well either. And so uh, we have a, a case where that's like that. But if I compare the fall banded, in soil banded, uh, we've that's the time that we close that gap, or we seem to have similar uh, efficiency on that. Okay. Um, and uh, okay. and the, the spring split did not perform all that well. I'll mention something more about that later here. Now the wheat response to nitrogen placement, uh, that's four years and, and he has others on the way looking at this. Again, same color coding on the bottom. Compared to the spring banded, the fall broadcast again did not perform that well, although it looks like agritain may have helped close that gap a bit. Fall banded performed very well. Uh, in fact, the single year when ESN was applied, it did extremely well in that case. So fall banding still performing well and spring broadcasting still not uh, meeting uh, the yields that we were achieving there, nor the spring split. That was with the portion put on before seeding and the rest put on uh, uh, following in crop. Now, this is in contrast to the research that Don and uh, Amy completed uh, just a couple years ago. Uh, and Amy's research found actually superior yield and protein with that split. But Amy also had I believe you had rain within five days of your application. And I think that's the real secret and the risk in this type of uh, system is you need rainfall to incorporate that in-season nitrogen. Uh, just a, another note here looking at uh, with wheat, we use protein as a measure of nitrogen uh, efficiency also. And again, we see that that fall broadcast is just not uh, meeting the standard of the side band, fall banding, looking okay. So just a summary here of some recent research that the consistent winners are still banding at seeding and the fall application performed very well also. Consistent losers would broadcast, whether it was fall or even spring performed poorly in these studies. And occasional winners, well, we do see occasionally the enhanced efficiency fertilizers improved uh, uh, that performance. Uh, and uh, I guess the hope was it improved performance of broadcasting, but not quite up to snuff yet with uh, compared to banding. Other nutrients, I'll just uh, close out here and look at some historic research here, just because we tend not to do this much anymore, but looking at the efficiency of placement uh, some of this work uh, done where phosphorus uh, being applied with the seed, uh, 22 pounds per acre is equivalent to 45 pounds per acre if it was broadcast and incorporated. So we see that phosphorus placement advantage. And with potassium, we also see that a seed placement advantage compared to what could sometimes be up to two to six times more required if it's broadcast. Now these, these applications are not necessarily meeting removal amounts, but those are things that uh, need to be taken into when fertilizers are perhaps at a I'm assuming John's battery died and he got kicked off. So <laughs> I'm gonna say we're gonna let John or Don continue. Okay, can you see my screen? Yeah, it looks good, Don. Hopefully John makes it back for questions. I'm sure he should be able to. <laughs> I 
I was panicking because I saw that note come up on the screen about battery low, and I thought, well, my goodness. But it it worked out okay because that was actually John's last slide where he was talking about potassium fertilizer banding being so much more efficient than um, the banding of uh, than the broadcast method of application, anywhere from two to six times greater uh, efficiency from potassium fertilizer banded versus broadcast. And that was his wind up. And that's the transition for me to talk about um, uh, the, the the issue of, of, of manure management. So I'm, I'm gonna just gonna go ahead and uh, talk about manure management. And then at the end, we'll have an opportunity for questions. Hopefully, John will be back online soon. It might be a little difficult though. I think that there's a limit to the number of people that can join in. And so there may be uh, some challenges for, for John to rejoin us. Uh, anyways, let's uh, talk a little bit about the issue of, um, of, of manure management. It's, it's certainly an, an, a cost-effective option for people to explore if they have access to manure, either their own or um, their neighbors. And so we've um, seen fertilizer prices right around the world. Here's a headline from Ireland and, and, and calling attention to the fact that there's manure all over the place as if you can find it and, and use it, you'll, you'll find a very cost-effective um, way of, of bypassing some of these high fertilizer costs. But we're going to be going back to the same principles of the 4R sort of nutrient management stewardship concept. We're going to talk about the right rates for manure application, how important it is to aim for nutrient balance over the long term, and avoid uh, over applying manure on a regular annual basis at an end base rate because it leads to XSP accumulation. We're going to talk about um, the right source and placement for manure and how important it is to incorporate over um, uh, the um, the the broad the 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 broadcast applications just aren't aren't nearly as effective, uh, and we're also going to talk about the right time, how important it is not to apply in winter, in particular in in a continental climate like Canada has. So uh, Joanne has already described some of the key benefits of manure in cropping systems. It supplies macronutrients, micronutrients, a whole array, a feast, a buffet of nutrients available for crops. Then also for soils, it's increasing organic matter content, stimulates all sorts of indicators of soil health, microbial activity, soil structure, water holding capacity. Um, cation exchange capacity, soil BH and buffering capacity, all sorts of wonderful benefits from manure. But there are some challenges as well. The uh, manure's uh, nutrient composition varies with the moisture content in particular and the amount of bedding. So the nutrient content in the feces and urine can be either diluted by water in liquid manures or by bedding in the solid manures. And it also changes with the uh, weather uh, exposure to excess water storage and handling. And it also comes with a sort of pre-existing balance of nutrients that may or may not be ideal for the crop in the field that you're wanting to fertilize. It also is very dilute in terms of its nutrient concentration, once again, diluted either by water or bedding. So there's a short economic hauling distance, usually just a few kilometers. And then, of course, there's issues like odor and pathogens, which are a concern not only environmentally, but just for the neighborhood. And then excessive rates can pose environmental risks. Uh, and this is something that Joanne's already highlighted. You don't want runoff. Um, from these manured fields, creating all sorts of water quality problems, for example, or, or groundwater leaching problems. So if we look at the uh, range of nutrient concentrations in manure, and we take a look, let's say, at some liquid pig manure and some typical solid beef manure in Manitoba sort of studies, we see a wide range in uh, both types of manure in terms of their nitrogen content, a wider range in the liquid manure samples in this analysis. But if we take a look at the phosphorus concentration, it's even more variable, like over 400 times more phosphorus in some liquid manure samples than others, whereas like a tenfold difference in phosphorus concentrations in solid beef cattle manures, but lots of variability to wrestle with there. 
And if we take a look at the variation in nutrient content, even from one manure storage, the variation in manure's nutrient content during a pump out, this is an agitated liquid manure storage in Manitoba. At the beginning, the nutrient concentrations were relatively high. In the middle of the pump out, the nutrient concentrations relatively low. And then at the end of the pump out, once again, the nutrient concentrations become high again. This really uh, pushes the need for um, on the go kind of nutrient monitoring, something that uh, some of the implement companies are, are, are developing, which is wonderful. So we do have a challenge in terms of variability of, of the nutrients, but there's there's also different forms of nutrients in the manure. And so for nitrogen, for example, there's three forms that we're concerned about. Two are determined by analysis. A total nitrogen content is measured in the manure as well as the ammonium nitrogen content. And then the organic N is regarded as the difference between the total and the ammonium. And so you know, what you'll see in a typical manure analysis is um, a listing of total Keldol nitrogen, that's the total nitrogen in the manure, which they measured in the lab, the total ammonium nitrogen, which is also measured, and then they just subtract the ammonium from the total for the organic portion. But there's a lot of variability in that nitrogen, and there's a variability as well, and it's availability to a crop. And so the available organic N that is um, estimated in our Manitoba guidelines anyways, is it's estimated at 25% of the organic nitrogen comes out in the year of application. And what we found, at least with our, our solid pig and dairy manure trials, we get nowhere close to 25% of that organic and becoming available in the year it's applied. This is uh, probably an optimistic assumption. The available ammonium in, on the other hand, is determined after estimating the losses by ammonia volatilization or gassing off. And you just subtract that proportion that you estimate is going to be lost by volatilization. This came up in Joanne's uh, conversation as well. It's very sensitive to weather conditions and application methods, cool, wet uh, conditions with the manure injected or incorporated immediately can minimize the volatilization losses. Anything else, the, the losses are substantial. So if we take a look at the chart that we use here in Manitoba, if you incorporate within a day and it's warm and dry, you can still maybe lose up to 50% of your ammoniacal nitrogen. That's why we promote injection or immediate incorporation so, so vigorously. Uh, those standard numbers, though, especially with respect to um, the amount of uh, nitrogen that's coming out of the organic fraction, uh, can be way off. Some of the stockpiles, solid manures that we've um, evaluated also have a fair bit of nitrate nitrogen. But the availability of that organic N is the big question. If we take a look at typical CN ratios for, let's say, um, chickens, layers, um, laying hens, and we take a look at for solid beef manure, we see some, especially with the beef manure, some fairly high C to N ratios, and that uh, carbon is fairly stable as well, and so pretty resistant to decomposition and not likely to release much nitrogen in the year that it's applied. So to evaluate some of those manures, the liquid manures and the solid manures, and compare them to synthetic fertilizer, we um, undertook um, a long-term project that went uh, for two different phases. The first phase was with regular applications of uh, synthetic fertilizer, as well as uh, liquid manure from pig operation and two forms of solid manure from pigs and from dairy. And we had two application rates over this um, eight, nine year period. And we had yearly applications to meet the crops and requirements using standard formulas. Then we had intermittent applications, which, which I'm not gonna talk about as well, but this was a more um, sustainable sort of approach of intermittently applying the manure so that we weren't uh, overloading, especially with respect to phosphorus. But I'm, I'm just gonna give you a few numbers from the, um, long-term trial with the annual applications at the nitrogen based rate if we look at the performance of liquid of, of the uh, nutrient sources with synthetic fertilizer indicate indexed at 100 percent and then we look at the performance of the liquid pig manure 
and the solid dairy manure and the solid pig manure, you can see that the solid manures in particular did not work very well in the initial years of application. They were in fact uh, probably tying up a bit of nitrogen during their decomposition and not releasing much nitrogen through the process of mineralization. And during this period, it took a while for the solid dairy manures to get going. But once they got going, they started getting much better at releasing uh, nitrogen. And the liquid pig manure also started to accumulate um, some organic reserves in the soil that were mineralized during the growing season. So that you can see that by the end of the trial, the manures are doing quite well relative to synthetic fertilizer. At the very beginning of the trial, not so well. And it's probably because our formula that we are using to determine the application rates was overestimating the availability of the organic nitrogen coming out of those manures. Those are the yield increases. If we take a look at the amount of nitrogen that we recovered in the crop that was harvested, uh, they follow, these follow the same patterns. If we sort of index synthetic fertilizer here at 100, it shows that we actually um, had some problems with the manures getting the nitrogen out of those manures as expected, probably because we underestimate, overestimated, I should say, the amount of nitrogen coming from the organic fraction. But once the manures got revved up, they, um, they did well in terms of providing nitrogen. And so at the end of this period, like we started uh, fertilizing these plots for the 2008 crop and fertilize them all the way up to the, to the 2015 crop, then we um, sort of changed tactics and we wanted to see, well, how much um, nitrogen was going to come out of those manure treatments and fertilizer treatments if we suspended the uh, nutrient application. So at the, that transition at the end of phase one, we wanted to sort of keep track, take, take stock of how much of the nitrogen we seem to recover comparing our fertilized treatments and manure treatments to the control. And we estimate that we were able to recover in our annual cropping system about 64% of the synthetic fertilizer nitrogen that was applied. The yearly uh, liquid pig manure was about 49%. So very close, statistically no difference from the synthetic fertilizer. Once it got established, that liquid pig manure system worked well. But even after eight years of cropping, we recovered only eight and 11% of the nitrogen that was applied in the solid pig manure and the solid dairy manure. After eight years, we're at eight and 11%. So obviously our estimate of 25% of that organic nitrogen being available is way, way, way off. The, slowness of that release is much is that the release is much slower than we than we anticipated so in 2016 and 17 we uh, grew crops on our long-term sites without any applications of uh, manure or fertilizer uh, in in some of our plots but we also um, continued with a with a synthetically fertilized plot and the long-term control just to give us some sort of index once again of uh, performance and we wanted to see well how much of that nitrogen that was stored left over from the manure applications would come out in those next two years and so here's a, a table that shows the yields of wheat in 2016 and canola in 2017 and our long-term control which is not gone now gone for nine ten years without any nutrients being added is down to 15 bushels of wheat and 14 bushels of canola the synthetically fertilized treatments that went you know back on the same old same old 57 bushels of wheat in 2016 and 60 bushels of canola in 2017 but here's the treatments that had received manure over those previous years and where we've stopped adding manure and they've built up momentum of that organic nitrogen reserve is coming out during the growing season and you can see excellent crop yields overall and in fact in all of the shaded sort of uh, cells in this table, there's no significant difference between the unfertilized, unmanured plots and the continuous synthetic fertilizer treatments. So you see, for example, here, especially with the discontinued dairy manure, 
we've got excellent yields that match almost exactly the yield for a synthetically fertilized field. And this is with no additional fertilizer or manure added over those two years. And it's all coming out of that mineralized organic nitrogen on the right hand side of this table estimates of how much nitrogen was coming out of these uh, treatments where there was no fertilizer or manure applied tremendous amounts of nitrogen now coming out of those uh, manure treatments so as a friend of mine from the states uh, would say once those manure treatments get revved up and that organic n reserve starts to kick out nitrogen through the mineralization process, you can see big contributions of nitrogen. Well, what about other nutrients in manure? The phosphorus contribution can be substantial as well because the chemical availability of the phosphorus in manure is often similar to chemical availability of phosphorus from fertilizer, but we don't have precise placement. And John talked about the importance of banding nutrients. Well, we can't band the um, phosphorus in the manure as close to the seed as we can commercial fertilizers. So we estimate that from an agronomic point of view, it's about 50% less efficient than fertilizer pea, which you can ban more precisely. If we take a look though at the livestock manures phosphorus composition, the ratio of available nitrogen, which is a very important parameter in the manure determining application rates to the total phosphate is about one to one or less in a lot of manures. If you look at that same ratio of N requirement to phosphate removed in crops, it's usually greater than two. So you usually get at least two years worth of phosphorus with one application of manure at uh, the N based rate to meet the uh, crops needs. So application of manure to meet the crops N requirements results in enough application to pee for several years of crop production for better. In situations like this one, right now where we've got very high phosphate fertilizer prices intermittent applications of, of manure phosphorus and and the phosphorus concentration in manure being so high is a benefit especially across western canada where we see that anywhere from 60 to 80 percent of our soils are testing phosphorus deficient so having that um, option to apply manure is, is a real benefit. And I'll just show you some case, typical case studies here. If you have a typical hog manure and a typical cattle manure, and you're aiming for an 80 bushel yield of barley, I know that's a very modest yield, but it's just, a, just an example. And you put on enough uh, hog manure to meet the crops and requirements, you'd be putting on 72 pounds of phosphate per acre, taking away only 35. So you'd end up with another year's supply of phosphorus. So basically getting two years supply of phosphorus with one application of pig manure at an end base rate. On the cattle manure, it's actually got a richer concentration of phosphorus relative to nitrogen. And you'd be putting on enough phosphorus for about uh, four years worth of uh, production. So very, very um, rich source of, of phosphorus for the annual crops. Now, if we take a look at the scenario for perennial forage, the NP ratios are different there. And if we put on enough liquid pig manure for the N requirement of that perennial crop, we'd actually be putting on about six to seven years worth of supply of phosphorus in the cattle manure. You'd actually be putting on about nine years worth of phosphorus. And that's if that perennial forage is harvested at hay. There's a little footnote at the bottom, assumes that the forage is mechanically harvested as hay and not by grazing animals. In our grazing studies, working on manured soils, we found that the removals of graving, grazing animals is only about five pounds of phosphate per acre. So if you're putting on 200 pounds of phosphate with a liquid pig manure application, you're basically putting on 40 years worth of phosphorus for a grazing system. Or in the case of cattle manure, you're actually putting on about 56 years worth of uh, phosphorus removal for a grazing type of program. So anybody that's working with manure and grazing systems has a, has a relatively large surplus of phosphorus. Now our system that we were working with in our annual crops, we had harvesting, so we didn't have the extreme um, surpluses of phosphorus, like in a, in a grazed uh, pasture type situation here. But still, we saw remarkable increases in soil test P. This is Olson P. 
going up in our annual crops with regular applications of solid pig manure, solid dairy manure, liquid pig manure, then the control and synthetic fertilizer. Our control or synthetic fertilizer treatments actually declined in soil test P. We we're putting on less P than the crop was removing. And in the synthetic fertilizer treatments, we're following the standard sort of short-term sufficiency uh, recommendations. And these thresholds that we're crossing here have regulatory implications because Manitoba has phosphorus regulations kicking in at 60, 120, and 180 ppm. The solid pig manure in particular applied at nitrogen-based rates on an annual basis, really jacking up soil test P. For the potassium content, the potassium content is often greater than the phosphorus content. The chemical availability of potassium is very, very strong in the manure. And the agronomic availability is maybe compromised because we don't have that access to the band placement. So uh, we know that we're not going to be quite as efficient with potassium uh, in the form of manure as we would be with fertilizer, but still get substantial uh, increases in potassium fertility when you apply uh, manure on an annual basis to meet the crop's end requirement. Here's the, the PPM value in the soil test K. We start off with very high values of like uh, 700 PPM, and then by the end of the experiment with solid pig manure, we're up to 1400 PPM. Uh, soil test case. So if you've got potassium deficient soil and you have access to manure, that would be the, a real high priority situation to apply the manure on that field that might be low in K. Sulfur, just a warning about sulfur and manure. The forms in su of sulfur and manure are generally not plant available because there's a lack of oxygen inside the animal's digestive tract and manure storages. And so we have reduced forms of S in the manure and only sulfate, the oxidized, oxidized form of sulfur is available. So the only form that, phosphor, that sulfur is taken up as is, is sulfate. And if there's no sulfate in the manure, then we don't have sulfur in available form. So crops grown on manured land can require supplemental fertilizer S. I'll just show you a chart from a paper that Jeff Shano published a number of years ago, in the Canadian Journal of Soil Science. If you take a look at the uh, treatment where you put on manure, it um, responded very well to supplemental applications of uh, sulfate S in particular you need to watch out for sulfur deficiency on manured soils because the manure's sulfur is not in an immediately available form. So NPKS, pretty, pretty decent long-term benefits of uh, NPKS in the manure. How do you um, confirm that your nutrient rates are okay, whether it's manure or commercial fertilizer? Well, soil test, soil test, soil test. Um, Here's a picture that Amy took of John helping with soil sampling out in the field during some of her experiments. And there's three really good reasons to soil test every field and every management zone every year. First of all, as a pre-plant prediction for next year's crop, what sort of manure or fertilizer rates should you be looking at to fill the gap between the crop's needs and the soil's supply? You also want to be looking backwards as a post-harvest evaluation of the nutrient management plan that you followed for the last year. Look for signs, for example, more nitrogen mineralization than expected. If you've got a history of manure or something else that's giving you more mineralization of nitrogen than you expected, then find out about that capitalize on that by reducing next year's uh, application rates. Then monitor over the long term for any upward or downward trends in soil fertility and soil health. Decreasing soil test P, for example, where you might be um, robbing your soils of phosphorus, increasing salinity in your subsoil. There's reasons for next year's crop, last year's crop, and long-term monitoring to soil test on a regular basis. So we've talked about the right rate and the importance of um, managing manure carefully in terms of rate, but there's also a couple of comments I want to share about source placement and timing. Manure should be injected or incorporated wherever possible, especially in the fall. And in fact, that's required in the Red River Valley of Southern Manitoba. You are not allowed to apply manure between September 15th and November 10th, except where you're going to incorporate 
or inject. And, and this is actually a long-standing process all the way back in 2006. The majority of our manures is incorporated or injected for agronomic reasons and as well as um, environmental and, and uh, social reasons. Timing wise, we don't want farmers to apply nutrients on frozen soils or snow covered soils. This is well documented as being very wasteful agronomically and is also high risk of contamination, especially in a continental climate where the soil freezes, the runoff uh, becomes highly enriched with the manure or the fertilizer. So this is not a good situation. All of our live, livestock operations in Manitoba have had winter applications banned since 1999. And then the province went universal for all farms, all forms of nutrients, manure and fertilizer. As of 2013, the winter applications are banned. But this is, this is um, and within the prairies, kind, kind of focused only on Manitoba, the regulations aren't as tight in some of the other provinces as I understand. So just to give an overall summary in terms of manure management, the right rate, we want to aim for nutrient balance over the long term, avoid applying, applying the manure year after year after year to the same fields, and because you're going to build up excess of like P and K, use the right um, application methods by injecting or incorporating and of course uh, do not apply on frozen or snow covered soils. So just to loop back to John's uh, initial comments, we're in a sort of a high stakes time uh, for nutrient management. Um, we've got high prices for fertilizer and crops and have increased the financial risks of both over fertilizing or under fertilizing. So we want to apply our nutrients as uh, efficiently as possible to avoid that penalty. It also means that we've got excellent rewards for careful application of fertilizer and long livestock manure. So there's an incentive there, a positive one as well. And employing the uh, principles of uh, for our nutrient stewardship of making sure that you've got the right rate, place, time and source is, is more important than ever. So this is, is something that's very, very important to keep this, um, these traditional sort of principles, classic principles in mind. Um, they're even more important in the current circumstances with the high fertilizer and crop prices. Okay, so that um, wraps up my presentation. I don't know how we've got maybe just a few minutes left for questions. Hi, John. Thanks. Uh, yeah, we have a few minutes for questions for sure. I'm just going to, I see that John's back on. Uh, okay. Computers back in charge. Um, if John has any comments, he can hop on. Otherwise, I'll jump. There is a question in the chat as well. Also, anyone else that has questions, feel free to throw up your hand or put it in the chat. Okay, so I'm, I'll am i ask the question for Don that's in the chat right now. So given that manures typically provide more P than is usually needed, should manure be applied once every two years to reduce the potential for P losses to the environment? Yeah, good question, Mervyn. Um, I, I think that it depends on the situation that you're in with respect to the field. I, I wouldn't hold back from uh, annual applications, successive annual applications on a soil that was very, very low in phosphorus. If I had a farm that had like a couple of fields that were really, really low in P, then those are the fields that I would maybe target for successive annual applications because I want to build them. And then I might want to avoid putting any manure on those other fields of my farm where I traditionally applied manure and I might have like, let's say 40 ppm of Olson P. I, I want to be more selective probably and, and use that P building characteristic of the annual applications at the end rate to, to build P in some circumstances if it's agronomically and environmentally uh, beneficial. Okay, I'll give, there's a question for John here. And do you think that the soybeans lack of response to applied phosphorus is related to a phosphor, phosphorus uptake pattern that's different than other crops that have been tested? Well, that, that's a great question. And one that uh, 
uh, Don's student really wrestled with, but we brought in a student all the way from Brazil to figure out phosphorus on soybeans. And uh, yet we had to go back to that work Don that Bob Soper did with radioactive yeah. phosphorus. It was, it was radioactive, right? That's right, you're yeah. correct. Radioactive phosphorus to see uh, where crops got their phosphorus from. And it was showing that when, when uh, fertilizer was labeled with radioactive phosphorus, that the, the rapeseed or canola and the oats and the flax tended to tap into some of that phosphorus, soybeans a little bit, but later in the season, those soybeans just kept taking up phosphorus out of the soil reserves. And uh, soybeans being um, a little longer growing, and I don't know, may maybe they continue to grow longer, take up more from uh, warm soils that have better availability than those other cool season crops. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, soybeans seem to, to excel in phosphorus uptake. Now, we don't recommend putting no fertilizer on phosphorus. That's a very short gap uh, approach that got a lot of Manitoba farmers into trouble 10 years ago when they depleted their soils because of their soybean rotations. And uh, I think they've learned their lesson and hopefully have been in a rebuilding process. Uh, Don, do you have anything to add? You, yeah, you did the research. The, 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 the old literature from the 1960s research that you mentioned showed that soybeans took up twice as much soil phosphorus in our Manitoba soils than, than the other crops in the tests. And, and so they're outstanding in terms of sucking back the, the, the phosphorus. Now, uh, Peter Johnson has said at low soil tests, see good response to soybeans in Ontario. We had, we had uh, over 50 bushels per acre soybeans on soils testing 3, 4 ppm Olson P with no response to phosphorus at three different rates and three different placements. So, you know, we, we struggled. We had one out of 27 trials or 28 trials that showed a response to P and that was um, soybeans on land that had been cropped the previous years to soybeans. So even, even soybeans can eventually exhaust that uh, phosphorus reserve in soils, but man, oh man, they, they have been, haven't been very responsive in our field trials, even at very low soil test P levels. John, can you speculate on why there might be that difference between Manitoba and Ontario? Um, well, and, and Manitoba maybe and almost like the rest of the world, I suspect it's probably related to um, the form of P that uh, is in our soils that we have tend to have high pH soils and calcium magnesium phosphate stored uh, forms of, of, of phosphate. And I suspect it's a, it's a rhizosphere acidification effect or something like that, but I, we haven't done the detailed studies. But there is evidence in the literature that, that points towards legumes being more effective at taking up the calcium phosphates. Okay, uh, there's another question here for John um, from Jeremy. Uh, I was given the impression that soil nitrogen release from organic matter does not provide a credit to the crop. Does this mean that agronomists should be ignoring the expected nitrogen release? data on the soil tests? Um, well, I would think that if they're in Western Canada, they want to be cautious about that. Uh, we do see often tests that come from the uh, Midwest or humid environments where they have a greater assurance that there's going to be good growing season moisture, soil uh, moisture. Then uh, this mineralization is probably much more predictable. But what we find is that if, a, if a, a sample from, I don't know, Western Canada mistakenly got sent to one of these labs uh, in the Corn Belt or someplace, they look at our high organic matter levels and they rub their hands with glee and think, wow, look at all that organic matter just waiting to bleed out. Well, we have seen that. Uh, in 2016, I grew 200 bushels of corn south of Winnipeg on that bled out mineralized nitrogen, but that was under moist soil similar to what they might have in Illinois. The last couple of years, when it's dry as a bone out there, your mineralization is very much reduced. So uh, that expected nitrogen release is as good as your estimate of what the growing season moisture is gonna be. Uh, yeah, John, John, you, you John. may as well 
kick in on your relationships? Well, I, I, I won't get into too much of that. I think the most important comment, though, is what you made earlier, that if you're going to get uh, give a credit for expected nitrogen release from soil organic matter, then you have to also go with an expected nitrogen penalty for your fertilizer nitrogen. And fertilizer nitrogen, probably 30 to 50% of the nitrogen that we apply as fertilizer gets tied up through immobilization. So you can't just take one side of the mineralization and immobilization process and focus on it. You've got to take a look at both sides. And if you've got, let's say 30 to 50 pounds of nitrogen mineralized from the soil's organic matter and 30 to 50 pounds of your fertilizer nitrogen being immobilized, they cancel each other out. And that's why you see so many agronomists in the Northern Great Plains simply using soil nitrate plus fertilizer nitrogen equals nitrogen supply. And they say that mineralization and mobilization generally balances out unless your soil test indicates that you've got way more or way less nitrogen than that formula would indicate, then that's what I would go with as an initial assumption. I don't see any more questions coming in through the chat. I'm wondering if Nancy could please put up the QR code. I'm not sure if she's actually there or not. Um, otherwise, I can share it on my screen again. Um, oh, there. So there's the QR code from the talk. If there's any additional questions for Don or John or even Joanna still on the line, um, now is your chance. Otherwise, we are going to carry on. We'll leave the QR code up for a bit here. And again, just a reminder that we are planning on doing another one of these Brown Bagger agronomy sessions in March. Um, the details still and exact date are still being decided on, but it will be focused more on pest control or pest management and spraying. Um, but again, uh, the last half anyways of this presentation was recorded for hopefully anyone that couldn't get on the call. That was an unfortunate hiccup that we had, but looking forward, we will get around that. Um, other than that, thanks very much to Don, John and Joanne for the great talks today. Thanks, Amy. Thanks for your chance to torment people from coast to coast, Amy. <laughs> yeah, I just found speakers that I had worked with in the past. So we'll hopefully have a different um, audience. Hopefully we have more people logging on from the East next time. Thanks to everyone that logged on. Okay. Thank you.